Welcome back to Mi Valle Mi Vida. I am Juan Carmona. And I am Mariana Luna, and we are your hosts. I don't know about the rest of you, but Juan and I love us some Japanese cuisine, especially sushi. And do ramen noodles, too. In fact, the RGB's love of sushi has grown to the point that you can find sushi at HEB and even some convenience stores. There are also sushi restaurants and noodle bars popping up throughout the valley. For some of you in the RGB, this proliferation of Japanese cuisine and culture might seem something very recent, but that is not actually the case. So in this episode, we are going to share with you the history of Japanese in the Rio Grande Valley. For those of you who attended our little talk at the Wasako Museum over Tom Mayfield and the San Juan Hotel, this is the episode that we were discussing. Also, there are a lot of Japanese names in this episode and me and Juan are going to do our best at the pronunciations. We apologize in advance if we butcher some names. Um, That is not our intent, but like I said, we are trying our best and we want to be as respectful as possible. So we just are making this little side note before we get further into the episode. The major push factor that brought the Japanese to South Texas was the racism faced by Japanese and Chinese in California. In the early 1900s, the first major group who made their way to the RGB came to work in the newly emerging agricultural industry, which in the 20th century was quickly replacing the ranching industry of South Texas. In this first wave of immigrants called Issei, what was one farmer who found success, Hishiro Miyamoto. He would go on to help bring more Japanese to the region. Some of these farmers brought wives with them, but other newcomers married locally, like Tomaso Tomas Kato, who settled in Hidalgo. These industry families attempted different crops, such as rice, but due to soil depletion, rice was not successful. In 1919, the Yomato colony, Yomato being a word meaning friendship, was founded by seven Japanese families, Seichi Noguchi, Tanjiro Kawamura, H. Hatanaka, Nabutaro Kitayama, Tomas Tomaso Kato, and Frank Etsui Izumukawa, who wanted to establish a business in what was referred to at the time as truck farming, which is when you establish a farm to produce crops for shipment to outside markets. This group of men combined their money to purchase 403 acres from the Brulee Plantation in an area outside of Brownsville. Yomato Colony produced crops that ranged everything from beans, onion, pepper, broccoli, and carrots. When it came to Japanese farmers in the valley, Minori Kowahata is credited with being the first person in the Rio Grande Valley to successfully grow lettuce. The colony only lasted a few years and was hit by various natural disasters like freezes, which damaged many of the crops. They also faced a law first passed in California and eventually in Texas, which denied land ownership to the Japanese, known as the Alien Land Law. A law like this struck at the heart of the colony and even led to some unscrupulous business practices in which Anglos would sell the land to the Japanese but keep it for themselves. Consequently, the colony broke and members either moved to other parts of the valley to engage in other businesses, packing and fishing, or they left South Texas. Culturally, the Japanese quickly adapted to the valley, with many learning Spanish before they spoke English. Kei Kitayama, a Japanese living in the Rio Grande Valley, spoke of her mother as making the best tamales she has ever had. Indeed, some of those who settled in the Rio Grande Valley remain here and are part of the colorful Rio Grande Valley community. The Rio Grande Valley area west of Brownsville was a particularly popular destination due to its mild climate and undeveloped yet fertile farmland. One migrant to the valley was Uichi Shimotsu, who settled near McAllen after graduating from a Colorado agricultural college. In 1916, he returned to Japan to bring Takaku Suchi back to Texas as his wife. Other Japanese families settled in scattered parts of the valley, farming mostly cotton in the summer and vegetables in the winter. Although separated by miles of rough roads and farmland, they congregated on special holidays to eat, drink, and socialize. Later in the 1930s, these immigrants formed the Rio Grande Valley Royals, a social club for their children. On occasion, the Royals met with the Lone Star Club, a similar group composed of offspring of rice colonists from around Houston. In response to the 1921 alien land law that was introduced into the Texas legislature, Japanese landowners in South Texas banded with Japanese businessmen from Dallas cotton firms to fight the bill. Their leader was Saburo Arai, a well-respected nurseryman from Houston who provided letters of support from Anglo-Texans and who testified for the group before a Senate committee. Although legislation eventually passed, a compromise was struck allowing Japanese currently living in Texas to keep their land and to purchase more in the future. Still, the Texas land law accomplished its intent, with no prospect of owning land Few Japanese newcomers were attracted to the state. In 1924, the final blow came at the national level when Congress passed the Johnson-Reed Act, 
halting all immigration of Japanese into the United States. Also, in Jan- January 1921, during the sa- that same political climate, the Harlingen American Legion post gathered a hostile crowd at the city's train station, warning off a group of Japanese who were attempting to disembark and forcing them to leave the city. December 7, 1941, changed the lives of all Japanese Americans, after which many began to be rounded up and shipped to internment camps. Though per- through personal relationships with prominent members of society in the valley, no Japanese in the RGB were interred, but they were heavily surveilled by the FBI and local law enforcement. Additionally, many ended up volunteering for the famous All-Japanese 442nd Infantry Regiment, which would go on to earn honors in the war, so much so that they earned the most combat medals than any other group in proportion to their numbers. President Truman remarked that they fought not only the enemy abroad, but racism at home, and won. After the war, the anti-Japanese sentiment was still high, sending more Japanese to the RGV. Indeed, when those Japanese that were interned in Crystal City, Texas were finally released, they made their way to the RGV due to families and friends' invitations. When doing this research, we came across an article from The Monitor on December 8, 2007 by Travis Whitehead called Japanese Farmers Made Significant Contributions to Valley History, which provided a lot of great quotes quotes from Japanese residents of the RGV we thought we would share with you. Happy Kitayama remembers spending the long hot hours farming his own 350 acres and the other property he leased around Donna. Cotton was one, was one of our main crops. Happy Kitayama's father came from Hiroshima in 1903 after working in the pineapple industry in Hawaii. Happy was born near San Benito. We grew everything, said his wife, K. Iku Kitayama. He had a lot of vegetables, too, like cabbage, onion, carrots, pepper, broccoli, you name it. Kay and Happy are both children of Japanese immigrants. They are among a small group of lifelong Rio Grande Valley residents of Japanese descent who made significant contributions to local history. Carl Utsuki was born in a small town near Beaumont, but moved with his family to the valley when he was only three months old. I think we stayed in Mercedes until 1942, then we moved to San Benito, and we farmed the Oyama's land. It was long hours. Otsuki attended San Benito High School, where he excelled in sports and met Faye Wood, who would later become his wife. He later continued his education on an athletic scholarship. Although Faye Utsuki says intermarriages were not very accepted at the time, neither she nor Carl encountered, encountered much discrimination. Carl's parents had both died by that time, and his wife's parents loved him. Minoru Kawahata, who immigrated from Kagoshima, Japan in the early 1900s as a member of the Yamato colony. Iwata stated that after the Yamato venture ended, Kawahata went to Far and then to Hidalgo. His daughter Rose Sakai, who remembers him as Jimmy, said a man cheated him. He had bought land with an Anglo, and at that time the Japanese people could not buy land, it was restricted, and he bought it with an Anglo and he cheated him and put it in his name. He never really spoke to that man again. Her father, she said, raised cotton, beans, and tomatoes, but he's especially known for introducing lettuce to the valley's agriculture. Iwata stated that hardships led Sakai's father to do the impossible. When other farmers of the valley stated dogmatically that you can't plant lettuce successfully in the Rio Grande Valley, he refused to listen. He planted the crop on his Hidalgo farm and produced excellent lettuce, each acre yielding from 250 to 300 crates of the green gold. Sakai said her father went to grammar school long enough to learn to read and write in English. He wanted to, he really wanted to learn the language, and so he learned to read and write and to read the newspaper. Her father became Americanized in more ways than one. He named one of his sons Benjamin after a cartoon character named Ben Gump. He was from a country that didn't even have funnies in the newspapers. I thought that was really interesting, she said. So one thing that I thought about when doing this episode is that it's pretty fascinating how at times the valley was a safe haven for groups facing discrimination in other parts of the country such as runaway enslaved people before and during the civil war and now japanese fleeing from california yes indeed the more we look into the history of the valley the more we can see all the different groups who've co- of people who have contributed to the unique border culture culture that we live in today one quick little note, this past Friday, our very own Miss Ariana Luna was awarded with the Outstanding Teachers of the Humanity Award, which uh, makes me feel like things are coming full circle because my second year teaching, I won that award and she's my former student and it just it felt really good to see her uh, earn those honors. So I just wanted to do, do a quick shout out and let, her, let you guys know about Ariana's accomplishments as she moves forward in her teaching career. Well, that's it for this ep- episode. So until next time, we love you, RGV.